Hey everybody, Omar here, the Knife Shark Guy, and I am back with another fun-filled video for you today. And today we are going to take a look and revisit what I said I was doing. Now, if you guys recall, about two or three videos back, I said that I was giving up uh, custom knives, and I was going to basically just collect three final uh, production knives from three totally different companies, and I asked all of you guys to guess. Uh, you know, unfortunately, nobody did any guessing or bothered to guess on my comments, but uh, it seems like my channel's moving along, so I'm going to go ahead and continue with the videos anyway. Uh, but, in any case, what I have underneath this towel is number two production knife that I have decided to keep in my collection and use in everyday carry. Now, the reason I'm doing this is because when I first started collecting high-quality knives, I wasn't in the customs yet. Um, basically, I was just collecting stuff that I really liked aesthetically, but I didn't really know much about uh, the, the deployment systems. I didn't know anything about the blade grinds. I didn't know anything about the blade shapes. I didn't know anything about the steels as much, but I was still learning. So what I would do is I would buy a high-quality knife, I would use it for a little bit, then I'd get bored with it, sell it off, and move on. And that's just the way that it went. You know, I was still learning. I still wanted to learn and discover. So now I'm at a point now where I'm collecting custom knives, uh, very high-end custom knives. I feel like I've kind of come full circle. So now what I'm doing is I'm trying to see if uh, I can take the information that I have learned in the past about my hobby and bringing it back to a lot of those high-end production knives where I didn't really understand what I was, you know, collecting or what I actually had in my hand. So now I feel like I have some knowledge, a little bit of, a little bit of knowledge now to my hobby and just kind of wanted to pay respect to a lot of the companies out there that make these great products. So underneath this towel is knife number two. If you guys recall, knife number one was the Benchmade Anthem. I had to have this knife. I thought this was probably one of the best knives that I had ever seen uh, as far as quality, as far as performance, as far as action, uh, everything at all. I mean, this was it, you know, one of the it's anyway. Underneath this towel, why don't we find out and see what I've got. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and reveal the towel, what knife number two is. And knife number two is a ZT. Specifically, the Zero Tolerance 0562. Now, there's a lot more to this knife uh, than its popularity, and I wanted to get into that right now. First of all, obviously, here's the box. Uh, now, word before we even begin, my ZT is actually customized, okay? Uh, this is the actual, this, this ZT is actually the lower grade version of the 0562 in LMAX, and I wanted to get the LMAX steel. It's one of my favorite steels. Now, LMAX is not a super steel, but it is a premium high grade steel. It's right up there with CTSHXP. Might be even a little bit better than CTSHXP. Uh, but yeah, this is mo probably one of my most favorite steels next to CV20, M390, and uh, 204, CTS204P, which are actually all the same steel. Um, yeah, this would be like my second favorite steel of all, pretty much. I, I just I wanted to have an LMAX blade in my collection. I didn't have one, so I chose this knife. Uh, so this is the Zero Tolerance 0562. Now, this knife is no stranger to the knife community, and that's exactly the, my point regarding this knife. Um, it's a lot more iconic than uh, some of the other knives out there now. When you get into knife collecting, you're going to find that there are a lot of iconic knives out there that actually represent a company. Spyderco is actually one of them. Uh, they've got, a, you know, they've got like the, uh, the, the Kershaw, I mean the Kershaw, sorry, the Spyderco Manix. They've got the most popular one, obviously, is the... Um, the paramilitary two, which I've never actually owned or held, ironically enough. Probably that was probably one of the reasons why I never got it, because everybody else got one. I wanted to get something different, you know, I wanted to be the different guy. So this knife, however, um 
it's just a very, very iconic knife uh, made in, in a collaboration. I, I think this is probably what I would call a one-hit wonder piece. Um, but we'll get into the knife first. So the steel on the knife is uh, L-Max uh, steel. Uh, this has the carbon fiber scales on it. Like I said, this knife was upgraded from the original. The original just had black T10, which I actually have in this box. Uh, in fact, maybe I'll go ahead and take that out so you guys can see that. This is the original uh, casing that comes with the knife. If I get it out of here, here you go. Let's go take that out. So here it is. This is the original scale that comes with the knife, which is just plain old black G10. Had it upgraded with the uh, carbon fiber. Um, the carbon fiber uh, scale here with the blue hardware uh, provided by MX Gear. So you guys might want to check those guys out. They've got some really nice hardware. It's fairly affordable. It's not a little too much, but it's basically just another way for you to customize your knife. And, uh, you know, I've chosen this piece specifically because it had all these, you know, kind of nice bling to it. And I figured it'd be kind of a nice idea since I've already owned the knife and I got rid of it. Probably the dumbest thing I ever did. Um, but, you know, nevertheless, the past is the past. So, in any case, why the ZT0562? So, getting back to what I was saying, the ZT0562, this is pretty much, uh, represents pretty much the entire knife industry, this knife right here, my opinion, my opinion, um, this knife is in collaboration between Zero Tolerance and Rick Hinderer, who makes the, uh, X, uh, the XM18, which is very, very popular, and that's what this knife is actually modeled after. Now, the XM18 is, a, from what I heard, it is a, it's a great knife, but it also had some sort of, you know, some people were actually complaining about... Um, workmanship issues, uh, you know, that had, sh you know, sometimes it even had shoddy action, whatever. Um, nonetheless, that shouldn't fray from Rick Hinderer's work as a knife maker. He's a great knife maker. Now, is he the greatest knife maker in the world? No, he's not. Is ZT the greatest company in the world? No, they're not. However, it's the union of those two people creating this knife that made, makes it such an iconic knife. I mean, you see this knife, you just, it just, something inside just gets you. Pretty much, and, it, and which is basically true, because if you go on YouTube, everybody, including their dog, has done a video on this one, and it, it says something. It means that everyone was drawn to this knife at one point in their knife collecting. Whether they kept it or not, they were still drawn to it, and this is pretty much the holy grail for, for the entire ZT lineup. I'm going to say even to this day, people seem to be drawn to this knife. Um, this is one of those knives that you would consider to be a, like a one-hit wonder knife. Um... It's just, in a lot of, in most people's eyes, not in everyone's eyes, but collectively, all of us as knife makers, at one point or one time or another, have seen this knife and said, this is it. This is the knife. Now, again, like I said before, I wouldn't consider Zero Tolerance the greatest knife company in the world, and I don't consider Rick Hinderer the greatest knife maker. Uh, knife maker in the world. However, the union of those two were so perfect to produce such a knife that caught everyone's eye. Not only did it catch everyone's eye, but it also hit everything all at once when they got this piece. So let's get right into this again. I'm sorry I got interrupted, but like I said, my knife had all different kind of hardware on it. So I got the LMAX steel on here. I got the really beautiful blue hardware on it. Um, the blade has sort of got like a an aggressive stone wash finish which is fantastic uh because i already used it you probably can't even tell uh but that thing's gonna hide hide scratches so well i really really love that idea there's Rick Hinderer's name right there. So it's got a really great drop point blade. The knife is a fantastic slicer. The ergos are great. Um, let's take a little closer look at the knife. One of the most thing, one of the things people love about this knife, and definitely one of the, the strongest points on the knife that people are drawn to it, is that it's a very, very discreet knife in the sense that the deep pocket clip is really, really deep pocket clip. Um, 
somebody described the pocket clip in one of their videos as like this isn't just deep deep pocket this is like negative zero and it completely disappears into your pocket uh the pocket clip rides all the way to the end of your jeans so this knife will completely hide inside your pants no one's going to see it at all so discretion i think was a big big selling point for this knife um obviously the ball bearing action on it is fantastic um the knife has a very hard detent i'll have to say a uh, couple of things about that um, but that, that doesn't detract from the fact why I, I still like the knife. No matter what negatives it has, I still really like the knife a lot. Um, it's got a very, very hard detent on the knife, um, when you're opening it. In fact, I can't even open it with this sort of swept up hook there because it hurts, actually hurts my fingers. So I actually put it right there, flip it right there, make sure I keep my hand away from the frame lock. Otherwise I'm going to sit there like a moron pushing real hard and it won't open. So I just kind of do that and it pops open nice and easy. So the detent is real hard on this knife. Um, centering on it is pretty much dead. I mean, it might be a hair that way, but I can live with it. Nothing to complain about. Uh, not really. Um, one of the other interesting things about this knife, too, is that people keep thinking that these are thumb studs. They're not thumb studs. What these are are blade stops. Usually, uh, they've got a bar toward on like it has here on this knife. And what happens is the, the, the knife, the top knife, when you deploy it, it hits this bar and it stops the knife from traveling that way. Well, in this case, you can see the knife also has the bar, but that's not what's stopping the knife. So you can see when I, when I flip it open, what's actually stopping the knife are the two blade stops right there. So people were trying to figure out how to flick the knife, uh, thinking what's up with these thumb studs, didn't realize they weren't really thumb studs, they were blade stops. I will say this, however, if the knife is, I guess, loose enough, or maybe you loosened it a little bit, you can pop them open with that, but it's still a challenge uh, because the blade stops are just too close to the handle to be able to be used as, uh, as, as thumb studs. They would actually have to be a little bit further, pushed out a little further out, so you'd have the angle to pop them out that way. But the only access to opening the blade at this point is the flipper. I think a lot of people were just fine with that. The action was really, really nice. Uh, it's a very, very smooth knife running on KVT ball bearing system. As you can see right there, a little jerk, and the thing falls, just pretty much falls shut. I mean, it's just, uh, yeah, you can't complain with that. Um, Aesthetically, uh, keep in mind on the original, the, uh, the, um, tell <laughs> so my mind has gone, gone blank. Uh, these screws right here, I'm sure the name's going to come to me soon. I'm an old guy, so be, you know, be a little sympathetic. Um, these were actually all DLC coded originally. So aesthetically, uh, these are DLC coded. Another thing too is the deep pocket clip isn't really a standoff. There you go. So the three standoffs are, um, you know, they're originally DLC coded in the original knife. And here they're, you know, got that nice anodized blue coloring. Now the fourth one really isn't a standoff. It is and it isn't. Uh, it's really a way to kind of uh, attach the deep, the deep uh, pocket clip onto the knife um, so that you can have that knife ride really deep in your pants and you don't have that, you know, no one can see it. You know, it can be as, as discreet as possible. They probably could have came up with something else other than a standoff. I don't know why I keep thinking that, but aesthetically it looks kind of weird, right? Because you got these three that are perfectly spaced and they look real pretty. And then there's this one right here on the end. Even this way, it looks, it looks kind of okay in this direction when you're looking at it aesthetically. But in this direction, it's like... One, two, three, and then what the hell is that? It just looks weird. Uh, but it works. It works. Um, again, you know, like I said, the action is really smooth on the knife. It's a frame lock. Uh, another interesting thing with this knife, it's got like two lock bar stabilizers, which I thought was weird. Now, here's the thing. Look how thick the titanium is on this knife. This thing was, this knife was from back from the day when they actually were, 
modeling all their knives after this model, proudly overbuilt, big as a real beast, or big as a beast was their motto. Uh, in the last three or four years, they've gone away with that. I can't say this. For 2020, they introduced one brand new model uh, in all tan. Maybe you guys can check that out on uh, YouTube. Uh, but there's one desert tan model. It's really, really big. It's pr pretty reminiscent to going back to when... Um, Zero Tolerance first first started in 2012 when they came out with all these huge, gigantic knives like the 560. You guys remember the 560? That thing was huge, you know. And and they've actually come back to that because you can't have a motto that says that they're built like a tank and all their knives, you know, look kind of wimpy and small. Uh, it just doesn't. It just doesn't work. I mean, case in point, the ZT 470, which is a really great knife, but it's not as big as a beast. So, this knife, on the other hand, is kind of in between, right? It's, it's you see it. It's still big as a beast, right? I mean, look how thick the titanium is on that knife. And like I was getting back to my point, where this has two lock bar stabilizers on there uh, to prevent you from pushing the lock bar out in this direction, but it's so freaking thick. How in the world? Even over time, there's no way that the, you, you would be able, you would even push the, the lock bar out that way for any reason. Even if you're using it for incredibly hard, hard, and hard use, there would be no reason for that to be. But it's it's in the design. I guess they wanted to secure that lock bar, and they, I don't know what can I tell you, they really, they really, really secured it. Um, but yeah, so the hinderer lock bar stabilizer is on there. Plus, we've got this little guy right here. So perfect little thing there. I'm not even sure how this works. I just know it's a lock bar stabilizer. I'll have to get back to you on that. If anyone wants to comment and educate me on why this is there, I'll be more than happy to take that explanation. So the knife, the blade shape itself is just really great. It's got a lot of great belly. It's a huge blade. But at the same time, it's thick on top, and it is. It, then it comes down to a really thin slice or grind over there. It's got a really beautiful hollow grind on that blade. You can do some serious work with this. Uh, at the same time, it's definitely a knife that that is a strong one. So you can use it as a slicer, and you can use it for hard use. So I think that's probably one of the main reasons why everybody gravitated towards this knife. It's the duality of use for the knife. Uh, some knives do not have that. I mean, I can't see using my Benchmade uh, Anthem in that fashion. I probably could, but aesthetically, if I had to choose between two knives to do something really hard work, I'm going to choose the ZT over, the, over this one. And not because this knife costs me a lot more, but because this knife is, it really is built for that. So... Let's go ahead and do some size comparisons. So some of you guys who uh, may, may not have ever had this knife, I can't imagine that, but I'm sure everybody, knife collector somewhere down the line has actually picked up this piece. So <clears throat> let's go ahead and put it up against the knife that I had up here earlier. This is the Benchmade Anthem. All right. And it's kind of nice to see that I've got different knives now to do my videos for. <laughs> we'll put it up, also put it up against the Kershaw Knockout. Okay. Mm, Kershaw Knockout. How about the knife that I had here yesterday and the one I put up the video on yesterday? Uh, Kershaw Norad. Uh, I might be selling this knife, by the way. Not quite sure yet. But if anyone out there is watching my channel and you're interested in purchasing it, uh, make me an offer. I bought it for $63 or something like that. If there is a... A uh, fan of someone out there who's watching my channel and would like to, or maybe just starting to get into knives and want to get their first, uh, you know, maybe their first knife that they've ever had, you know, contact me. I'll make a deal on this with you. Uh, you know, it's a really great knife. You guys, if you haven't seen that video, you check it out. So there is Krishan Norad. <laughs> Took away the knockout. How about a smaller knife? Uh, the very, very iconic Spenza 21, which is now the Spenza 31, because this knife doesn't exist anymore. They've replaced it with a, uh, a much smaller knife. I actually don't think the 31 looks better than the 21, by the way. That's just my opinion, but there you go. So, this is a fairly large 
to normal, regular sized knife. Uh, let's go ahead and do, um, you know, some of the specs. I don't have a ton of them for you. I'm not really a specs person, but let's go ahead and at least do the, the uh, size of the knife. So knife size overall is roughly, yeah, from the tip all the way down to the end, it's roughly about eight inches in length, maybe... Yeah, about, well, yeah, I'm roughly about like 8 point, I'm going to say like 8.3 inches in length overall. Um, there's so many videos on this knife that I don't really need to do the specs on them. If you want to find specs, you probably just look that up on their site or something. So, back to the video. The, the knife, like I said, it's a very, very iconic knife. The union of these two, Zero Tolerance and um, Roy Kinderer, have produced in most people's eyes... The perfect knife collectively maybe not everybody you know in the whole world thinks this is the greatest knife in the world however all of us people in a knife community like i said we've ran into this knife at one point or another and if you just see it it just looks like knife it's one of those one hit wonders um but the one hit wonder just keeps on going and going and going if you want proof this knife is still in their lineup Ever since the day they released it, they have not discontinued this knife. I don't think they're going to discontinue it. They may even do one. This is going to be one of those knives where they're going to do like a 10th anniversary deal and do something special with it. Uh, probably all of us going to eat that up. And, you know, because this is really the holy grail uh, knife for Kershaw. Um, there just has never been a knife like this that has created such an impact in the knife community um and like i said it's not like zero tolerance was the greatest knife company in the world they are a great company rekindra certainly isn't the greatest knife maker in the world but something about the union of those two now keep in mind um rekindra came in and became the main uh their main designer for at least a couple of years he didn't just do a lot of stuff for zt he also did a bunch of things for kershaw he was the maker of the uh kershaw cryo knives if you remember and he did quite a bunch of designs right after ken onion left in 2010 to go join crkt all the knives pretty much became almost like rick Hinderish looking uh they had the cryos the cryo knives a bunch of other knives they still had you know the leak and the blur and all the other ken onions they were kind of fading away and rick Hinder was come was taken over you could pretty much tell that during that time like between 2010 and 2011 2012 right around that period just when this was beginning to emerge and then at the same time uh because rick Hinderer was a high quality knife maker he transitioned into pretty much creating the entire zt lineup for their first year you know with the five six i'm not sure if he created the 560 or not but he created a bunch of knives for zero tolerance the day they actually stayed, this company began, um, and, you know, all of their knives were, like, overbuilt. I can't help but think that the proudly overbuilt idea probably came from Rick Hinderer, maybe right around the time, um, that, that Ken Onion was leaving, and then, uh, Rick Hinderer was coming in, maybe they scoped him out as the main guy, and it worked, it worked, um, and ever since then, they've been going strong. But, you know, because of that, the next couple of years after that, people were like, well, I love ZT knives, but can you create something like a little smaller <laughs> for me? So they had to go back and downgrade all their knives. And they, they went away from the built like a tank, not immediately but kind of slowly you started to see them all fade away and then all the knives would look like the 470 and then the rj martin was it the 609 they were all these slim cool little knives that just you know they were they were appealing for people like myself but people went to zt because they made knives like a tank and then they, all of a sudden they just went away so this knife, however, stayed in the lineup um as a representation of this motto and it worked it stayed there so the the knives were you know newer knives are coming in some of them were smaller some of them were bigger but this one stayed in the lineup so everybody can remember what their motto actually was so it's just kind of interesting how everything evolved so now the zero tolerance 0562 
this knife has pretty much become the mark, in my opinion, my opinion, of all the knives that came after it. You know what I mean? It was like some qualities of this knife had to wind up in another knife. It just became like the trend. I mean, it's kind of like going from jazz to rock and roll. When they went to rock and roll, everybody had to sound like Elvis, or everybody had to sound like the Beatles, and, you know, whatever it was. So there's some parts of this knife, or some qualities of this knife, have to wind up in all the other knives that came after. And so that's probably the main reason why I chose the Zero Tolerance 0562. It just screams knife. And... When I saw the design, it was very eye-catching, and I, I realized this is the, really the knife that I keep coming back to. And I'm sure at some point, a lot of people that are into knives at some point in their life ran into this knife, gave their opinion on the knife, probably owned it for a little bit, and then got rid of it. And then maybe, like some of you out there like me, got rid of yours and got it back. Why? Because it really is a great great EDC knife. It's a perfect size. There's really not much to hate about it. It's a great slicer. Uh, it is literally built like a tank. It is a solid knife. The action is real smooth. I mean, you've got the KVT ball bearing system in there. It's a frame lock. Frame locks are always better than liner locks. You know, somebody be just because you're getting, your hand is being used as extra support to keep that blade locked open because you're now creating force by holding the blade this way unlike a liner lock where you've got like a slab of something over the actual frame and there's nothing that can protect it so it's always kind of nice to have a frame lock in my opinion it's a much more safer bet uh as far as safety goes and you know maybe the knife accidentally closing on you i don't see how it can close up on you with a lock bar two lock bar stabilizers that are this you know and the super thick titanium and on top of that, now your hand is going to be over that to keep that knife from closing on you. Um, it's got the really fantastic deep pocket clip. I mean, aesthetically, it looks fantastic. You've got the really nice... You don't have much jimping on there, but there is a little bit on there. So, it's really not much to hate when it comes to this knife. Um, it's just a great buy overall. That's another thing. You're getting value in this knife. Now, this knife back in, uh, I don't even know when they released this knife. I'm going to say they released it right around 2013, the year after Zero Tolerance had emerged. Um, this knife fall, at the, at the time, the price was right around $240, I believe. And now it's now 260 And that's the other thing, too, you have to consider regarding this knife. Once you hit the $240 price point, all of everything that you're looking for in a knife is there. Uh, I believe uh, Epic Snuggle Bunny had once coined that phrase. He actually said once you hit the $240 price point, uh, everything that you're looking for in a knife is there. You're getting quality, you're getting aesthetics, you're getting a great cutting tool all in one package, guaranteed. You know, you're, you're going to get the perfect... You know, everything, you're going to get, like, the perfect centering. You're going to get the really nice, smooth action. Everything that you want in a knife for that price point of $240. Guaranteed. Below that, there'll be something that's off on it, technically. Technically. Probably not, but technically. Um, but, yeah. So, this knife actually represents that level of knife making where, okay, we've hit the point. It's only going to get better from here. So... That is the reason that I have chosen the 0562 Rekinderer design. Um, any thoughts, any comments, please leave them below. Uh, you know, I, I hope to hear from all of you guys uh, commenting on my channel. Anything you want to say, uh, you know, your opinions are free. Just don't say anything nasty to me. <laughs> Uh, other than that, you know, if there's something that I've said that was wrong in the video, please correct me politely. I don't have a problem with that. Um, you know, so there you go. There you have it. The 0562 as my second production knife before I close out this chapter in my knife collecting life. Uh, I'm probably going to 
try and get a hold of more knives like this to review for you guys. Uh, something more new in the, uh, you know, either the Kershaw lineup or the ZT lineup or Spider or something. I'm going to try. I mean, it's an expensive hobby. Uh, but probably what I could do is I could probably wind up purchasing the knife for a day and then returning it. I could probably do that. They'll probably let me get away with that a few times. I don't know if I'm going to do that, but, you know, I might. Uh, yeah, definitely consider checking out this knife also. This is one of the newer models for Kershaw uh, 2020, the Kershaw Nora. Like I said, this knife is perfectly smooth. Now, I complained about this knife the other day being off-centered, but now if you guys take a good close look, Take a look at that. It's no longer off-centered anymore. I don't know what happened. All I know is I just kept flicking it and then closing it, and then all of a sudden, it. I think maybe something inside that I snapped back in place, and now it's, you know, it's pretty much dead-centered now. I mean, it might be a millimeter off, but not as bad as it was when you guys saw it, so. Yeah, this is my second knife. Uh, leave your comments and questions below regarding this knife. Anything about the knife, even the uh, aesthetics, like I said, uh, the carbon fiber and the um, standoffs, as well as all the rest of the blue hardware on the knife was provided by MX Gear. Dot com they do all that um, and at a very affordable price too I think this carbon fiber slab was like something like eighty dollars or something but it is a really good carbon fiber slab and it doesn't look like the elegant um one that originally comes with the original 0562 carbon fiber knife. This is a little bit more aggressive with a little bit more of a design but you know this this carbon fiber on this particular knife with this blade, um, it looks like this is how ZT should have presented this particular version of the knife um, because it just fits aesthetically. Everything on this knife fits. Uh, I love how the accents of that stone wash finish is all over the entire titanium knife also. So... Um, yeah, you like this knife? Yeah, definitely. You could probably just go and buy this exact one. Like I said, the exact one comes with the black G10 um, uh, slab on there. So it's actually going to look more like that when you get it uh, with the black G10 on it. And if you want this, you go to MX Gear. Probably all these stuff here probably will cost you under 100 bucks at least for everything here. <laughs> yeah, whatever. Um, but I think this look looks makes it look a lot nicer. So this is Omar the Knife Shark Guy signing off. <clears throat> uh, hoping you'll find this iconic knife in your collection. You guys stay safe out there, and I will be back next time. Probably with a conversation video. Thank you so much for watching, and you guys stay safe.